This is Workers' Comp Matters, hosted by attorney Alan S. Pierce, the only Legal Talk Network program that focuses entirely on the people and the law in workers' compensation cases. Nationally recognized trial attorney, expert, and author, Alan S. Pierce is a leader committed to making a difference when workers' comp matters. Welcome once again to another edition of Workers' Comp Matters. This is Alan Pierce of Pierce Pierce Napolitano in Salem, Massachusetts. We are a law firm specializing in the representation of injured workers in uh, on-the-job injuries. I am delighted today to share the microphone with my co-host, Judson Pierce. Welcome, and thank you for having me be your co-host today. This is great. And our guest today to talk about work and the future of work and those that perform the work is Daryl West. Daryl is the Vice President and Senior Fellow of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. He holds the Douglas Dillon Chair in Government Studies. He is the author of 25 books, including Policymaking, Turning Point Policymaking in the Era of Artificial Intelligence, along with some other books involving technology and digital technology and how it impacts social and political and economic institutions. He's the winner of the American Political Science Association's Don K. Price Award for Best Book on Technology and the American Political Science Association's Doris Graber Award. Uh, So welcome, Daryl. Alan, it's nice to be with you. Daryl, this is Judd. Welcome uh, to the podcast. What brought you to study artificial intelligence, robots, and develop some uh, information on the future of work? Well, I'm old enough that I did my dissertation on a typewriter many years ago. So I have basically lived through the technology revolution of first personal computers and then laptops and now smartphones and uh, artificial intelligence. And so my most recent book, uh, Turning Point, looks at the impact of AI on the workforce, how it's changing society, how it's changing the economy. There's clearly a lot of interest in that uh, topic. People worried about robots taking uh, their jobs and people are just wondering how all of this advancing technology is going to affect social insurance, uh, workers' compensation, healthcare uh, benefits, kind of the whole panoply of social benefits that people get these days. Right. And maybe begin right now by letting us know, if you can, what percentage of the workforce or work is being done robotically as opposed to with human hands? I don't know the actual percentage because it varies quite a bit from sector to sector, but we know in the manufacturing area, there are fully automated factories where basically robots are doing most of the work. I have been in Amazon warehouses and there are robots and automated conveyor belts uh, all over uh, the place. You can even think about uh, sectors such as retail. We have fully automatic uh, retail outlets uh, that have uh, developed now where you basically uh, walk in, you have the app on your phone, you walk in through a turnstile, you go shopping, you leave without dealing with any cash register or any human uh, sales clerk, they automatically charge your credit card or your mobile uh, payment system. So clearly there are lots of areas where technology is coming in, starting to take jobs and certainly starting to transform jobs. Certainly this isn't unique to the 21st century, I think probably even going back to the assembly line back in the early stages of automobile manufacturing, we saw the the, the beginnings of automation in replacing uh, the human hands and arms and backs of workers. Um, So we, you know, this isn't anything new, but by the same token, the advancement of technology has certainly ramped up the speed by which jobs are being eliminated. Yes, jobs are being created, but these are a much different type of work, correct? Uh, You're exactly right. And if you go back 100 years ago when industrialization was starting to come in and factories were starting to be uh, developed, there were similar challenges in the sense that it was very disruptive. Uh, People worried about the impact on work. There were a lot of worker harms. Factories were creating new types of challenges and risks uh, for uh, workers. But if you think about how society responded, we basically redid the social contract. I mean, we developed new programs, social security, uh, workers' compensation, unemployment compensation. Like there were a wide variety of policy reforms designed to help people cope with industrialization. 
And so today, I argue we're in a similar transition to the digital economy. There are new types of risks, new types of challenges uh, for uh, workers. We need to renegotiate our social contract to accommodate those changes and make sure that workers get protected as we are starting to digitize the economy. Absolutely. One of the things that struck me in listening to your interviews uh, over the years and uh, doing some reading that you've done is how we could move toward an era of dystopia versus an era of utopia. In other words, how if we don't pay attention to these social compacts, we might leave more and more people behind. What are your thoughts on what we can do from policy perspectives to ensure that people are protected in this new era of uh, work? I mean, you're absolutely right. We are at a crucial turning point, and that's the reason we uh, titled our recent uh, book uh, uh, that way, between heading either towards utopia or dystopia. And in the book, we argue the crucial variable in determining which of those paths we take is public policy. So, for example, a lot of the social benefits today are tied to the job. You know, it's an employer-employee relationship. So if you have a permanent job, you know, you get health care benefits, you're covered by disability insurance, you have contributions, often with a, a match from your employer to your retirement account. But as we are heading into the digital economy, we are seeing the rise of temporary workers, people who do not have a permanent job, and so therefore they're getting paid, but they're not getting the social benefits. They don't get health care. They don't get uh, retirement uh, matches. They often don't have disability uh, insurance. At the same time that this technology revolution is unfolding, we've seen this major change in business models in which employers are depending on short-term workers, temporary workers, independent contractors, basically people who are not getting benefits. Now, we can deal with that if we renegotiate our social contract to have universal health care so that you can qualify for health insurance and you can pay for health insurance even if you don't have a job. I mean, that was the whole point of the Affordable Care Act to basically provide that type of mechanism. And it actually has worked remarkably well uh, in the sense that the uninsured rate uh, dropped uh, dramatically. We need to think about the education component because as we move towards a digital economy, there are going to be people who lose jobs because they don't have the right skills. And so we, we need to emphasize worker uh, training, redevelopment programs, upskilling programs so that people can develop uh, new skills. So I'm actually an optimist when we think about the future in the sense that there are some clear problems that are going to emerge. There are going to be some clear harms for workers, but there are public policies that if we adopt them would make a huge difference and would actually push us much more in the direction of utopia as opposed to dystopia. And conversely, if we don't do these things, then the future actually could be quite grim. Let's shift a little bit to something I think we all can relate to, and that is the type of work relationship that is embodied in the so-called gig economy. I'm not sure if that phrase is, is being used as much as it had been up to this point, but let's kind of focus on the California experience regarding Uber and Lyft and that type of work platform that allows people to drive for a company such as Uber and Lyft. And, and as you may be aware, there has been a lot of concern about whether these workers are covered as employees for a whole variety of reasons, unemployment insurance, workers' comp insurance. And we know the California legislature uh, passed a, a bill last year, which essentially made them employees for most purposes and then this most recent election in November of 2020, Proposition 22 is on the ballot that was passed overwhelmingly. I think it was 58% to 42% by the, the voters of California, which basically nullified the legislation and kept these workers as independent contractors. You know, if, what does that represent in these workers in California and presumably similar workers around the country? in being covered by these social programs? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and it really illustrates the fundamental problem that we face right now, because in most states, a lot of the new e-commerce uh, firms, the new uh, digital uh, startups are basically hiring either temporary workers who do not get benefits, or they have 
full-time workers who they're classifying as independent contractors and often not providing full health care and uh, disability insurance uh, to those uh, individuals. So what the California legislature uh, did a year ago was to pass a law making it more difficult. Like if you work for Federal Express, you drive a Federal Express truck and Federal Express is basically helping you do your job and you are delivering packages for Federal Express, California basically said, you are an employee of Federal Express. Uh, You are not an independent contractor. So they kind of cracked down on the worker classification to make it more difficult for these companies to basically sidestep the social insurance part of the job and to basically uh, make it harder for them to have workers who were not getting uh, health insurance or uh, disability in uh, insurance. Uh, and so everybody kind of looked at this and thought, wow, you know, that's a, a great new step. Uh, that's uh, probably a step in the right direction for the uh, digital economy in order to make sure that uh, workers had adequate protections. But as you pointed out in November, there was this very surprising outcome, a public referendum where Uber, Lyft, and other companies uh, like that spent $200 million on a referendum and ended up winning. Uh, They ended up exempting themselves from uh, these new requirements, uh, which basically Mm -hmm. then returns the situation to the status quo uh, prior to uh, that uh, legislation. What we don't know is, you know, what is it that motivated 62% of Californians to support that repeal? You know, was it the $200 million that was spent, meaning it was kind of a one-sided campaign and they were uh, getting fed all these uh, negative uh, narratives uh, from uh, these companies? Or do they actually have a serious problem with imposing these types of new regulations on the gig economy? And we don't actually know the answer uh, to that, but it's an important question because if workers are not going to get adequate protection uh, from the companies, we are going to need a public policy response. But we have to bring the public along. Right now, as illustrated by the California vote, a lot of people don't think it's a problem. They seem to be content uh, with companies uh, classifying these workers as independent contractors and not providing public uh, benefits. We have an education campaign to help them understand why this is a problem and why they actually need to think about uh, tougher rules in this area. You mentioned the 200 or plus million dollars spent on this campaign. I've done a little reading uh, on this after the election, and one of the things I read, and I can't source it right now, uh, was that they polled a lot of the voters who voted in support of Prop 22, which would basically take away these protections from workers, and they thought they were they were voting the opposite. They were voting on, they were voting in the affirmative affirmative to benefit these workers. They it wasn't clear messaging that they were able to ascertain the fact that they were voting against the interests of these folks. So I think a lot of that has to do with the power of, of the dollar and controlling the message by a, you know, a heavy uh, TV and other types of ads to shape the public uh, perception. At this point, we're going to take a quick break and uh, we'll pick up on what the California experience has taught us and how government and public policy can react. So uh, we'll be right back with Daryl West. Does your law firm need an investigator for a background check, civil investigation, or other type of investigation? PINow.com is a -a one-of-a-kind resource for locating investigators anywhere in the U.S. and worldwide. The professionals listed on PI Now understand the legal constraints of an investigation, are up-to-date on the latest technology, and have extensive experience in many types of investigation, including workers' compensation and surveillance. Find a pre-screened private investigator today. Visit www.pinow.com. Welcome back. We are here today with uh, Daryl West. We left off with the California experiment and the kind of vote that sort of was a little bit disconcerting to, to those of us who protect workers' interests and advocate for the injured workers. I wanted to dovetail that into something you've said about individualism, versus doing this as a group, doing this together. And I think we've seen that in the most recent presidential election, the idea of the Biden campaign sort of overtaking the populist sentiments of Trumpism and whether or not uh, this idea of American individualism can be looked at a little differently in terms of, well, if he or she doesn't succeed, then that bears solid consequences on what I can do. What do you see arising out of the California experience 
for the country as a whole? I mean, the most important thing is we can't end up in a situation where a lot of people are being left behind. That's destructive for the entire society, and it creates a lot of social problems that everybody else then ends up having to uh, deal with. So I think one of the big divides in America now is uh, based on American individualism. As your uh, question points out, people basically think they're responsible for themselves and if they're doing well, it's because they're working hard and they're smart and they've invested in education. And if they're not doing well, where well, you know, it's your fault because you haven't worked hard, you haven't invested in education, and uh, that you're responsible for your own uh, situation. As we're moving to a digital economy, we actually are seeing a lot of people who are working very hard who are still being left behind, you know, because they're in uh, minimum wage uh, jobs or they don't have uh, the skills uh, to get a higher level uh, job. And what we need to think about is the dangers of having a lot of people left behind. I mean, we've seen it in recent elections. We see it in the sense of, you know, the debates we've had over healthcare. We're now in the middle of COVID and people have defined not wearing a mask as individual freedom and therefore they should have the right not to wear a mask. We see the consequences for society that you know, the pandemic gets worse and more people end up dying from that. So I have argued in several publications that Americans, you know, pride ourselves on individualism, but we need to have a sense of social responsibility that we're all in it together. You know, it's kind of the old line that a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Like if there are weak links in society, economically or otherwise, that creates problems for the rest of us. And we have a responsibility to help those people. And that can be through job retraining programs, educational uh, initiatives, or, you know, in the past, we developed unemployment compensation to help people who were uh, between uh, jobs. So, you know, we just need to think about what are the new challenges being raised by the digital economy and what are the appropriate policy responses to deal with particular challenges. Do you see the end of the traditional tests of determining who is or who is not an employee? They are basically either have been around the country, no matter what jurisdiction you go to, either the common law tests of exercise of control method and manner of payment or statutory encapsulations where by statute you define independent contractor. I know we're finding here in Massachusetts that we have an independent contractor statute, but the workers' compensation determinations of employment status does not necessarily have to follow the statutory construct of defining who an employee and employer is or are. So I guess in order to change or have the public contract embody the ability to change the digital economy? Do we have to begin by redefining the employer-employee relationship as it has always existed for the past several hundred years? Do we have to redefine the work descriptive working relationship between the producer of the labor and the beneficiary of the labor? I mean, the short answer to your question is yes, we do need to redefine the terms and the conditions that govern the relationship between employees and employers. I mean, most of these rules are now set at the state level. So a lot of these issues are going to be fought out state by state. And I do think we're going to see a situation of tougher regulation about independent contractors, uh, meaning making it more difficult for companies to define somebody who works for them as an independent contractor so that they don't have to uh, pay the uh, benefits. I mean, a lot of people can clearly see that that's not fair and that creates uh, an undue burden on those uh, people who are working very hard delivering packages and driving the uh, Uber uh, cars and uh, so on. So we do need to figure out a way to address that. I also believe that the new Biden administration is likely to work through executive orders and through Department of Labor rules to encourage a movement in this direction. Trump Ooh. has not really done anything constructive uh, in this area. And he's been very pro-employer. Biden will be more pro-employee. And so I would expect the federal government to start to encourage uh, states and localities to move more in this direction as well. I'm delighted in hearing about the pick uh, for Health and Human Services uh, being the Attorney General from California. It seems to me that that would be good for injured workers and, and our community who we advocate for. 
what I wanted to ask you was whether or not workers' comp has a place in the future of society. We saw it clearly have a place in the early 20th century, and each of the states have adopted their own methodology about how to accomplish it. But shouldn't there be some sort of national oversight or new national review to make sure that workers' compensation endures and actually succeeds? Workers' comp absolutely does have to endure because workers get injured on the job. Even as we move towards a digital economy, you know, people forget, you know, we think everything is being done online, and so there might be fewer risks. And that actually is not the case, because when you order something through an e-commerce site, there is a person who shows up at your doorstep carrying a heavy package. And sometimes those heavy packages do uh, create injuries. So the digital economy is still going to need a workers' comp. We need to figure out how to provide that, how to provide disability insurance. Uh, People are going to suffer permanent uh, disabilities as well after, you know, they've worked 10, 20, or 30 years uh, doing these types of jobs. So I absolutely do think workers' comp will continue to be very relevant, but the government will have to play a role in making sure that employers are respecting the law and that states have appropriate means of worker classifications. Yeah. One of the things I've noticed, Daryl, and perhaps you've been acquainted with it also, is as these types of sort of novel or alternative employment relationships have begun to exist, I've always likened it to trying to fit it into the workers' comp system as trying to put a round peg into an oval hole. It almost seems to fit, but it doesn't quite. And what I've, what I've seen and starting to pop up are insurance policies that are being provided that pay much more limited benefits than workers' comp benefits are, which are you know, obviously a creation of statute and legislation. But there are like occupational injury policies for Uber drivers or other types of, uh, of these workers, which might provide a sort of a skeleton of what basic workers comp. Workers comp by itself doesn't really provide a whole lot. I mean, it's a percentage of your, your gross pay and, and your medical bills and maybe some vocational retraining benefits. But some of these occupational policies might pay for uh, Uh, two years of up to two years of uh, wage replacement and maybe put a medical component with a cap on medical, but something far less than workers' comp. Uh, So, you know, one of my concerns is we're going to start to see a lot of these workers covered, but under policies that are so much more restrictive than workers' comp. Have you looked into any of, you know, this phenomenon of other types of insurance products being marketed? This is a growing uh, trend as the digital economy expands. There are a variety of different types of cyber insurance policies designed to protect companies from the risk that they all face as we're uh, moving into a digital economy. And some of it involves workers, some of it involves uh, businesses through their online platforms are actually getting into new areas that they don't know as well. And so therefore there are greater risks. There are risks in terms of uh, data breaches or cyber incursions, and so your private information may get stolen and become uh, public. So this trend towards cyber insurance is definitely uh, coming as part of the digital economy just because it is a traditional way to deal with risks. But the key thing, as you point out, is how those policies are structured, like what kind of deductibles they have, what types of caps they have what types of medical evidence you need to provide in order to qualify for uh, the insurance. I mean, the same way that, you know, sometimes I have home insurance and there's a problem and I contact the insurance company and it turns out there are all these exclusions, you know, things that I thought were included as part of my policy that actually are not. And so those are the things that we have to uh, worry about to make sure that the policies are not one-sided, that they don't completely favor the companies over the workers. Mm-hmm. All right. Before we wrap up, uh, any final words, Daryl, as what you see in the near term with a change of uh, administrations? I know we're expecting it, obviously, to be more pro-employee and, and, and an employer, but it looks like we need to get the, the population of this country, a very divided country, to begin to act in a more cohesive fashion in terms of um, the shaping of, of policy and direction. Any hopeful words in the short term? I actually am optimistic that there are going to be some uh, changes. I mean, I think the key thing with the digital economy is there's likely to be more job churn 
people moving from company to company and sector to sector. Like in my adult life, you know, I basically have worked for two organizations. So I taught at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island for a number of years and then uh, moved to uh, Brookings in uh, DC. Uh, when I talk to young people today, I tell them that's not going to be your life. Like you're going to have six, seven, eight, or nine different employers during the course of your lifetime. And so we need to make sure that benefits are portable as people are moving from job to job and company to company. Right now, there are a lot of problems associated with that, like, you know, maintaining your health uh, benefits. You move to a different company, they may have a different kind of health insurance. You have different uh, medical networks. And so, uh, you may no longer be able to go to the doctor you've been going to for the last uh, 10 years. So there's just a lot of logistical issues uh, in terms of benefits that we need to uh, work out as we are heading into this new digital economy. Well, I'd like to uh, wrap up and, and thank my co-host, Alan Pierce, and uh, our special guest today, Daryl West. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, Living so close to Harvard University, though, I sort of have a, a little bit of a favorite uh, Ivy League institution, uh, but uh, definitely would love to have you on a, any day of the week uh, from Brown University. You, you taught there for over 24 years, correct? I did teach there for a number of years, but I've uh, been uh, down in D.C. for a little bit more than a decade. And how do you like D.C.? I love it. It's been a chaotic uh, decade, uh, so many different <laughs> things uh, going on, but uh, it's it's fun to be somebody who studies political science, to be in D.C. and kind of be in the belly of the beast, so to speak. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for appearing with us today. Special word uh, from our sponsor, PINI.com, for qualified, specialized, private investigator, anywhere in your area, please go to PINI.com. And uh, for Workers' Comp Matters, I'm Judd Pierce. Thank you and make it a day that matters. Thanks for listening to Workers' Comp Matters today on the Legal Talk Network, hosted by attorney Alan S. Pierce, where we try to make a difference in workers' comp legal cases for people injured at work. Be sure to listen to other Workers' Comp Matters shows on the Legal Talk Network, your only choice for legal talk. Legal Talk.